we have five panelists, so I'm going to introduce them from your left to your right. Um, there's Ian Morrison, Spencer Leonard, Ed Remus, Thank Omer you. Hussein, and Tom Carey. And um, so the panel's gonna, we kind of follow the same format with all our panels, so we're gonna have about 10 to 12 minutes for op opening statements from all the speakers. Um, we'll follow this with three to four minutes where they can kind of respond to each other, and then we'll open up for a general Q&A. Um, so before we start, I'm gonna read the uh, panel description, and then we can get going. Draining the swamp, psychoanalysts of the left, and training the next generation of revolutionaries are all more or less problematic formulations which we have used to describe what motivates the Platypus Project. That given, these formulations all betray a peculiar attachment to that which we wish to forget, the dead left. Perhaps they express a secret and difficult desire that the object of critique might also be saved from the swamp, be receptive to the analysis, or indeed might learn better from our ped pedagogy. And yet we admit that this will not be the case. The task of this panel is not so much to inoculate such formulations, rather it aims to dissect them, to observe the motivations of our activity within Platypus, especially where we encounter the greatest difficulty for reflection. That is, when we meet to regard our activity as Platypus itself. With these thoughts in mind, we propose to ask ourselves, who is Platypus for? How do we assess our progress as a membership, as an organization? How do we identify our audience, and how do we become a platypus for them? The history of the platypus critique begins with a judgment issued on the dead-end course of the 20th century. Indeed, on the situation arrived at by all history proceeding, that the left has lived and died, that the progress of freedom continues to exhaust itself in chimerical forms, a platypus among others. But this judgment has not passed in condemnation, with the same breath it also cries, love of the left. The very unnaturalness of the historical chimera, it was thought, might mask, and hence disclose, the purpose of its true nature. At least for those still learning how to look upon its monstrous features, illuminated by the thought that the new does not add itself to the old, but remains the old in distress, in its hour of need. But today, the problematic has itself matured. We have now a first decade of the platypus critique. This has consequences for the continuing possibility of such a critique. Today, perhaps, the swamp of the dead left drains itself. In fact, this was already the case even before the first moments of the platypus critique. We must admit, our glance is retrospective, our pronouncements made post festum, but they, like capital, accumulate. It is left for us to reason through this process and so reflect on our reflection of the past, which is the present. Um, and so we actually have kind of an order that we want to move through that will roughly chart um, the different phases, both of platypus, but also of uh, its object in some ways, the millennial left. Um, and so we wanted to start with Ian, who we've asked to kind of respond to the description generally, but also um, to um, comment on the anti-war movement um, and imperialism, and then Spencer, who we asked to comment specifically on Platypus's interactions with the Communist Party of Great Britain and the IT, IBT engagement during what was called the Marxist turn. We've asked Tom Carey to talk about Occupy and anarchism. We've asked Omer to talk about the socialist turn and the millennial left, and then we've asked Ed to talk about um, what in Platypus we call the long fourth phase, but which really kind of refers to when we, um, when Syriza and Podemos were happening, we had a lot of panels on what is political party of the left. Um, so. Take it away. Can you guys hear me? Hello. OK. Um, so I guess I was going to start with an anecdote that um, I was talking with um, someone in Berkeley. He's sort of an older leftist who's been around like all, all the groups um, in the area and sort of a serial member of different um, far left groups. And, now he's uh, joined the DSA, and he went to a uh, DSA meeting at, um, at Berkeley, and the, it, was, it was a big meeting where they were getting undergrads to um, you know, get, get involved in the DSA. And the meeting was really, um, it was a very structured meeting, and it was all about getting uh, people to sign up to do their 
uh, canvassing campaign that they're doing for single payer healthcare. And he was telling me about this. I, I hadn't gone to the event. Um, and he was like, aren't the young people interested in global peace? Like, wh why is there no peace activism? Why is it all this um, healthcare? He's from the 60s. And um, I also, being asked to talk about this anti-war thing, I was um, being taken aback, um, or being taken back to this time, trying to like reconstruct my own thinking um, in this period, and I had kind of a hard time. And, and I was also, I'll, I'll just sort of walk through some of my own uh, perspectives at this time when I was in Platypus. Um, and, but they seem very distant to the moment right now. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's also probably not the only thing we did in this period, but it, it'll be the, the angle I'll take. Um, it, it was in this time uh, that I was in, uh, you know, in college here um, that I ha was sort of taking a deep look at the left um, and solidarity campaigns um, that were going on and that had happened in the past in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan because of current events. Um, and as I was saying, it seems so out of place now, especially with the Arab Spring and now this, you know, the, the ongoing war that's in Syria, et cetera, and Yemen. Um, so the left does talk a little bit, I know, about uh, Rojava um, and that, um, but, it, but it seems very different than, than it did when when I was in Platypus in this early period. Um, at, at that time, there was an essay that we read that was very um, popular in our, our milieu by um, Moish Bastone. And he called out in this es essay, uh, History and Helplessness, that the left didn't have a sustained critical analysis of movements in that region. Um, most analysis on the left uh, was wedded to a, uh, in, in his view, a kind of outmoded Cold War dualistic perspective, um, and it didn't have an adequate framework for understanding the end of what he described as the kind of Fordist synthesis globally, and how that was unraveling um, in the Middle East. Uh, in that essay, he, he points to this um, UN report uh, about sort of extreme economic sort of collapse that happened in the, since the 70s in the Middle East. Um, and, you know, clearly in that moment, a kind of political gap was filled, you know, by these, I guess, ab absolutist kind of states that are in the Gulf, but also, um, you know, the, the, the older kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of modernizing programs that, of Arab nationalism, that Ba'athism played, the Shah uh, played, that the Soviet Union played um, in Afghanistan, um, you know, came undone over, over a long period of time. Um, and it was in this context, this sort of, I guess, 50s, but I, also sort of 70s to 9-11, which was something that was, of course, on, on our mind at that time. I was interested in the context of Platypus um, to look at the left groups that were in these regions um, and how um, they had disintegrated, um, also how anti-imperialism um, both, you know, in the in the contemporary U.S., but also throughout these events, had been used, um, and we did sort of like deep studies I, I, of you know, I looked at the relationship of the Iraqi Communist Party to the Ba'ath Party's um, rise to power. We did um, a long uh, reading group that was about the Iranian Revolution. Um, we read articles by this uh, uh, sort of famous new left figure, Fred Halliday, about Afghanistan as well. Um, and, you know, a lot of the left, of course, was interested in the, you know, describing the character of various um, reactionary movements in the region. But this was an interesting space, I think, for me, because we also uh, wanted to look at the history of uh, the left. So, one kind of curious thing that's from very early Platypus is uh, the Iraqi Communist Party, which is sort of maybe sounds very obscure. Um, but uh, there were some interesting things about them in, in this context. 
One of them is that we read actually a statement that they wrote um, uh, after Saddam, Saddam had fallen. And also after Saddam fell, they were the main organizers of the Iraqi Federation of Trade Unions. And they, that trade union was a vehicle of international solidarity campaigns that happened in Europe and in the Labor Party and also here. We went to their, uh, we went to an event that, uh, where the American sort of part of the AFL-CIO was uh, hosting people who were involved in the trade unions in Iraq. Um, but the ICT, the Iraqi Communist Party, had some pretty controversial statements for the left. Um, they had entered the governing council um, before the first election. They, uh, and they also wrote something in their statement that I'm, I'm sure will sound um, controversial to people. Uh, quote, we struggle for creating the conditions for the withdrawal of foreign troops at the earliest possible time. However, we believe that calling for the immediate withdrawal does not take into consideration the sharp current polarization in our country the existence of paramilitary organizations and the insufficient preparedness of Iraqi security forces. Hence, we call for a timetable for the withdrawal together with doubling the efforts to provide the internal political institutional security conditions for such a withdrawal. Um, so this is pretty controversial on the left, certainly in the West. Um, people referred to them, I was looking at one article as you know, lackeys for US imperialism. Um, and they were obviously not um, at anti-war demonstrations um, speaking or anything uh, because they were not liked. Um, and to me, this was interesting because it, was, it seemed that the left didn't really have a kind of international politics um, in the context of the anti-war movement and that, again, sort of processing the history of the left, it was that you know, the left had a complete breakdown that uh, groups in different regions, of course, in a... In, uh, what was the big event at that time, of course, the war in Iraq, um, had completely confi conflicting um, perspectives and views. Um, and I was drawn at this time to sort of the ending of this essay by Morsh Prostom, where he says, um, however difficult the task of grasping and confronting global capital might be, it's crucially important that a global internationalism be recovered and reformulated. That was the end of the, that essay that we would read. This all raised a lot of classical formulas and problems um, that I was just first being introduced to. Sort of the role of the organized working class, you know, how that relates uh, geopolitically, um, the trajectory of the old communist parties. Um, also, I was not familiar with that. I didn't know that there was a uh, you know communist revolution in Afghanistan. Um, or you know the relationship with the, you know, this is big, uh, you know, the Tuda party in Iran, a lot of other groups, um, and there were you know, but we did experience in a certain sense these different splits that came out of the '60s generation, sort of the, the third world, or, you know, third worldist orientation. Um, there's of course a very strong uh, group that I guess I would call kind of like a, a liberal anti-fascist perspective, sort of like a, a Christopher Hitchens, but also softer versions of that. Um, and of course, these groups that did uh, solidarity campaigns. And then strangest of all, of course, were the actual left groups from this region. And we did do some events with, for example, the uh, Workers' Communist Party of Iran um, and Iraq, uh, which is sort of a 90s era group. Um, all these orientations had different estimations of the US and Europe. At one extreme, there was Habermas and Daria that thought that uh, Europe should counterbalance um, the U.S. On the other extreme was, as I was mentioning, Hitchens, and he thought that the U.S. played a progressive imperialist role. Um, there were groups and individuals that thought that the resistance um, could play a progressive role. The SWP in Britain is sort of has the most extreme view here. And then, as I was saying, there were these very small groups that um, actually were actors in these areas. Um, but the memory of a lot of these older parties that were bigger in sort of the 50s and 60s, um, old sort of uh, USSR-aligned parties in the Middle East, you know, they raised questions of what it meant, you know, was there a progressive bourgeois national force that could be supported in these countries? Or, you know, was it possible to have a two-stage revolution and somehow democracy could come to, um, to Iraq? And then also, uh, you've got the kind of more ambiguous sort of uh, uh, 
I guess I'm calling like permanent revolution type stance that certain Trotskyists and, and Maoist groups had, and they thought that you know revolution was possible and it would happen by kicking out the U.S. And for me, as I've sort of listed all these diverse perspectives, it was very vexing that the left adopted a certain kind of language of 19th century socialism and also the language of, uh, of Lenin and um, all of this, but they really didn't connect that to the concept of uh, socialism. They didn't even really connect it a lot of the time even to uh, a sort of the, this older notion of kind of like self-determination. Uh, much of it was a very vague discussion of democracy uh, rather than socialism, um, and it was, that was more the sort of the contentious space. Um, and it very obliquely, I think, raises something that's maybe more uh, contemporary about like, you know, what was the meaning of the old, um, you know, Marx is called like bourgeois revolutions, like the American Revolution. Um, you know, could oh, could one of these countries have that kind of a um, you know uh, revolution? Okay, I guess I had more to say, but um, I I guess I would segue to Spencer in the sense that it, it, it was that kind of odd context um, and groups and their sort of strange perspectives on this conflict that led um, the group and me certainly to look at the deeper history of Marx and um, these older events like the 1848 revolution and what that meant for what um, socialists in the past thought uh, politics were. I hope you guys won't be too strict with me on time. <laughs> uh, I did write a little bit here. Um, I tend to, in platypus presentations, use uh, the PR and my email as primary resources. And one thing that uh, I dug up from towards the end of the third phase and on to the fourth phase that um, that Chris wrote by way of Orgcom report uh, reads as follows, which I think is good for this to sort of set the tone for my comments. Uh, the challenge of Platypus is in integrating and assimilating the various different layers of historical experience among our members without throwing off those who were encouraged in one direction only to find that direction sidelined with new shifts of emphasis. A major resource for Platypus is the archive we generate through the publication of the Platypus Review, which embodies <laughs> our own historical record. We must be patient and systematic in our work, recognizing the potential frustration of not, be, of not being able to immediately recognize the effects of our efforts which can only remain obscurely cumulative. Increasingly, it will become important to systematically acculturate new members to the history of Platypus itself in order to arm them adequately for participation in our project. This will mean necessarily retreading what for many of our veteran members will seem well-worn and perhaps already worn out paths. We need to struggle against such jadedness all our members require the full benefit of our prior accumulated work. It is the task of existing and long-term members to accept and fulfill responsibility for recovering the history of our project with new people. I'm fairly awful when it comes to my own personal history. And I only could discuss this with my wife briefly regarding certain details and dates of the past about which she knows everything. Still, um, this much I know. Uh, I first became good friends with Chris after 9-11. Uh, my wife remembers the day when he first came over to our house for dinner, uh, which was in the fall of 2001. In 2000, and, and I also remember well, uh, by way of pre platypus experience, Sunit and I attending the SWP UK conference that prompted uh, Chris and young members of platypus to draft What is a Platypus on Surviving the Extinction of the Left sometime in the summer of 2006. 
someday I'll go back and disinter the emails that Chris and I exchanged around this time and immediately afterwards, especially those um, just after the um, summer of 2006, since it was at this time at their urging that Chris and his students set aside the older conception of Platypus as a journal project in favor of forming a reading group and eventually the Platypus Affiliated Society. All of those emails are buried in an old University of Chicago email account. Chris used to write me lengthy emails about the formation of the reading group in 2006, telling me about the young students, uh, including Ian here to my right, about the antagonism of Parker and John Abramite, the staging of the first panel discussion. I remember distinctly uh, sitting in smoke-filled internet cafes late at night in Delhi and Calcutta, reading Chris's emails and pinning lengthy responses and queries. It was not until I returned to this country sometime in September or October 2008 that I genu genuinely encountered what was by then Platypus, the live beast, whose poisonous sting induces hallucinogenic visions <laughs> of Marx and Lenin. It was then that I encountered the Platypus Review for the first time. I don't remember when we did the decline of the left of the 20th century for the first time, but I was asked to be on it, and that was effectively my recruitment to Platypus. Uh, and mindly, I was included basically on Chris's say-so, as I uh, didn't yet know that I was a Platypus member, or indeed that that was the culmination of my friendship with Chris that would forever be mediated through this project. I had never done Platypus, and if there was a moment which I re was recruited, as I say, that was it. And soon thereafter, uh, working with Ian, uh, writing my Christopher Hitchens piece. As my contribution to the decline of the left shows, as was deliberate, I was a student of Ben Bloomberg and Ian Morrison, uh, among others. I distinctly remember having issue number seven of the PR in front of me uh, when I wrote my bit. So in terms of my place in the history of Platypus, I was there and I helped reawaken to politics Chris uh, in the phrase that we used to employ. Platypus was in some sense born when Chris and Richard, two, became Chris, Richard, and me, three. But I'm not a member of the first generation of Platypus. And when I came along, I tried to honor that first generation by respecting what they had done and built. Especially, as I will not be able to go into any depth in, uh, about here in the way that I took up editorship of the PR. Ian was editor, but he was also president of the organization, and I needed an outlet uh, in which to contribute. I also wanted to teach myself uh, the history of the left in a disciplined way and threw myself into reading group pedagogy. Chris talked yesterday about uh, people teaching the reading group the first time they do it. Uh, and that was the way I did it. I'm forget, forever grateful to the students of those early years for letting me teach them, as in many cases they were more experienced in the readings than I was myself. As I've already said, I came back to Chicago from lengthy travels doing dissertation research in the autumn of 2008. And this was the time when Obama was being elected. And with that election, as we argued at the time, um, and I've already mentioned cribbing from Ben and Ian in chapter seven, I'll crib from Chris in, in issue seven as well, to talk about our recognition of the coming of the second phase. What does opposition to the Iraq war policy of the Bush administration really amount to? This is Chris in Iraq and the election, the fog of anti-war politics, issue seven. The Democrats jockeying for position is an excellent frame through which to examine the politics of the war. For the Democrats, criticism of the Bush policy has been transparently opportunist to seize upon the problems of the war for political gain against the Republicans. Opposition has come only to the extent that the war seemed to be a failed policy, something of which Obama has taken advantage because he wasn't in the U.S. Senate when the war authorization was voted, and so he's been able to escape culpability for this decision his fellow Democrats made when it was less opportune to oppose the war. Furthermore, opposition to the war on the supposed left 
has similarly focused on the Bush administration, thus playing directly into the politics of the Democratic Party, resulting now in either passive or active support of the Obama candidacy. The first phase of Platypus was already at an end. This was accomplished even before Obama won the election in as much as he had already vacuumed up the anti-war movement. If the 2016 revealed the left to be, as Chris and I often bitched on the phone, Democrats, nothing but Democrats, this of course was already plainly revealed in 2008 and long before. So the Obama election, including the political absorption of the anti-war movement that took place in the lead up to that election, occasioned what we in Platypus term our second phase, a period of time that extended until mid-2008, from mid-2008, let's say, until September uh, 2011, when Occupy began, though Platypus ran on inertia for some time afterwards. It was a period in which Platypus, what followed was a period, or what is the second phase, is a period in which Platypus turned inwards, in the sense of paying close attention to and, in a sense, advertising to the left our own internal pedagogy. Thus, in an early issue of the Platypus Review, under my editorship, appeared an article by Chris on Karl Korsch. This was something that I had, so to speak, commissioned as a book review of a then recent re edition of Marxism and Philosophy. This prompted a response from British humanist David Black, to which Chris replied in turn. Likewise, this was the period when Ian and Ben Bloomberg wrote what you might term major minor studies for the PR, some of which can be found today in the PR reader. This was a period in which Platypus's self-education was put on display. At the level of fora, this had, in a sense, begun earlier with the failed attempt at organizing a 40 years of 1968 panel in 2008, uh, but that also had something of a different impetus. Um, The following year, for instance, um, there was a somewhat less motivated uh, historical panel on, the, on 30 years of the Iranian Revolution. In other words, in the face of the extremely dramatic, though seemingly now quite forgotten, Green Movement in Iran, we addressed the issue through a historical lens. Chris followed up this intervention in the same mode with his piece on the Arab Spring that followed uh, a year and a half later, where Chris addressed the historical analogies of 1789, 19, 1848, and 1917. Over two years after the failed 1968 panel, then the University of Chicago chapter, largely at my instigation, staged panels on the 1960s and the 1970s, in which the earlier openness of the new left to being themselves superseded was much less in evidence than it had been at the time of the founding of the new SDS and of Platypus's own founding. At the same time, by pairing the 60s panel with another on the 70s, we underscored our own as well as the new left's historic Marxist turn. I prepared for and followed up on this 1970s initiative with a series of interviews on radical minds addressing above all 70s vintage Maoism in dialogue with veterans of the new communist movement, Max Elbaum, Claude, Clyde Young, Mel Rothenberg, and others. In my role on the ORCOM, largely at my, in a sense, largely as a result of my role on the ORCOM, Platypus came out of the closet as Marxists and, in a sense, as scholars of the history of the left. In this period, Yeja wrote on Rosa Luxemburg, Sunit on Fanon, Hasid and Brett Schneider on Adorno. Chris followed up his writings on Korsh with others on Gillian Rose, Cindy Milstein, and Anarchism and then with an address to the relatively vital sectarian uh, group, the RCP, and its attempt at a new synthesis of communism, coupled with a critique of Alain Bentou. We came to address the Marxian left as intellectuals, and for this reason then, around this time, I remember many laments that we couldn't engage the Spartacist League since their writings, whether on the black question or the history of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, uh, had formed a, a significant part of our own internal pedagogy as it still does today. At the same time, we began to engage the IBT, first in the 70s panel and then at the 2011 left forum, and, uh, at which Jason Wright participated on our panel on Trotsky. 
this left form was probably the clearest expression of the aspect of the second phase I'm highlighting here. There we put on panels on Trotsky, Luxembourg, Lenin, and Lukács, at which spoke, in addition to Jason Wright, Timothy Booz, Jeremy Cohen, Chris Catrone, Greg Gabrellis, Timothy Hall, Paul LeBlanc, Lars Lee, Ian Morrison, Marco Torres, and, so and Susan Williams. In Mar that was in March of 2011. In April, we hosted the plenary session of the third annual Platypus Convention, with the second plenary being the legacy of Trotskyism, at which spoke Richard Mike McNair, Brian Palmer, and Jason Wright. Richard Westermont and Andrew Feenberg at that convention helped to build our engagements, build on our engagements at the left forum with respect to Lukács. That summer we operated in much the same mode at the Marxist Literary Group conference here in Chicago. And also it was in that summer that Chris and I repaid Mike, Mike McNair's visit to our convention with a what was really in effect a residency at the CPGB's Communist University. After Occupy broke out, for the month that it broke out, the issue that we carried to it contained the transcript of the panel on the Marxist turn that I had organized with Carl Davidson, Tom Riley of the IBT, and Mel Rothenberg of Sojourner Truth, as well as Chris's rejoinder to Adam, David Adams' response to the piece that in many ways represents the culmination of our output in the second phase namely his response to Adam on Lenin's liberalism, something that Chris presented for the first time at the left forum. All of this contributes to a sense of a strongly integrated approach to developing, platyp developing a platypus perspective on the history of Marxism and its potential relevance today that we had not engaged previously, and I think this picks up on what Ian was just saying and that we could not perpetuate on into the third phase because Occupy intervened. This has meant that the question of Marxism and even of socialism had to be bracketed in favor of the question of democracy, specifically liberal reformism and neo-anarchism. And this transition occasioned a crisis in our organization, as I expect may be addressed by others here or in the Q&A. At any event, as Occupy waned, the Marxist left began to reemerge, for instance, in the anti-NATO protests here in Chicago, after having been rather, rather scarce during the period of Occupy's uh, emergence. In conclusion, the second phase lays the, laid the foundation for many of the difficulties that Platypus has experienced in responding to and engaging to Occupy and, in general, uh, to the left more generally and most fully instantiated our uh, impulse to become, uh, if you will, the Marxist intellectuals of the next generation. How am I doing on time? Am I over time? Yeah, but Omer said his was gonna be short, so. Sorry, Ian. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that uh, and, and simply to say that uh, the engagement with Marxism uh, and the history of Marxism putting on panels around anniversaries, um, the whole question of perennial topics, uh, which we always fight against, all of these are legacies of the second phase. <clears throat> uh, all right, can everyone hear me? Give me a second. Okay, uh, I'll try that. Okay, um, you know, I was going to scrap the stuff about my background, but I think it might be helpful uh, given the other uh, presentations. So, um, I uh, was actually kind of politicized before Platypus to a certain degree. Um, I grew up in a, in a kind of radical liberal family uh, that had, you know, my mother had vaguely new left views. Um, and when I was uh, about 16 uh, in high school, I, uh, we had to do research projects and I um, came upon the history of the United Fruit Company uh, 
And this kind of led me down the path of a kind of anti-imperialist leftism uh, that was really kind of purely through the internet uh, and mostly kind of uh, concerned with uh, the past, I suppose. Uh, but it was also during the time of uh, the Bush presidency. And so I, uh, it, it was relevant in that way too. So when I, when I came to school or, or to college, I, I already considered myself a socialist and I was looking for a socialist group to get involved with. Um, and when I came upon Platypus, uh, you know, partly because my introduction to the left had largely been through studying history and I didn't really know any real leftists, um, what Platypus was doing seemed kind of obvious to me at first. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah, the left is kind of a historical artifact and we need to interrogate that to uh, go through its failures and, and grapple with those. Um, so, uh, when I got involved, it was actually during the period where Spencer is kind of leaving off. So uh, it was during this kind of uh, deep engagement with uh, the 1960s and, and 70s left that year. Uh, and that was my first platypus panel was the uh, uh, little one on 1968s with uh, Mark Rudd and uh, Ocean Newman. Um, and these were uh, people who I had you know, seen as kind of the cool rebels or whatever in high school, but I didn't really know much about it. Uh, and it really had like a profound kind of effect on me to uh, see them up there in, in real, real life and um, realize that they, you know, really kind of didn't know what they were doing. Um, and seeing them kind of admit that in, in person. Uh, so it kind of, you know, stripped a lot of my assumptions about uh, you know, the 1960s kind of being this high point. Um, but really, I think that what kind of attracted me to Platypus um, is, well, there's an answer I can give about this. So early on, I went to a talk with David Harvey uh, and uh, Tana actually, after the event, made a comment uh, where she mentioned how nowadays uh, the political imagination of the left had narrowed such that uh, when people think about socialism, they uh, no longer really think about actually transforming um, the productive relations of society, but think of it in terms of redistribution. I was like, holy shit, that's totally what I thought. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, that's like intriguing. So, so I wanted to dig deeper, and you know, that year, I really I signed up for Spencer's class. Uh, and I came to the reading group religiously and attended the panels and, and really did this uh, um, deep dive kind of at, a, at, a, at this, you know, fortuitous moment in Platypus's face on uh, the history of both Marxism and the New Left uh, as well, and uh, the New Left's Marxist term. So when Occupy happened, uh, Chris, I, I remember at the time, uh, saying that uh, a lot of the membership was uh, unprepared for Occupy. Um, and I was definitely in that category. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, I really didn't know how to engage uh, with this phenomenon. Uh, to, to a large degree, I just kind of dismissed it because um, in comparison to Platypus, which seemed really ambitious and serious because of uh, its emphasis on setting the bar according to historical horizons and possibility, um, Occupy I, I kind of dismissed as lacking historical perspective, uh, high horizons, and uh, being subject to all these anarchist thought taboos, right? Um, so I, I didn't really see it as something uh, interesting or something that I, I really even um, knew what to do with, so I tend to just kind of avoid it. Um, and um, so partly for that reason, I, I was kind of hesitant to agree to be on this panel because I felt like, okay, like, you know, Occupy wasn't that much of like a learning moment for me in some ways, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, when I was thinking about it, um, and, and Platypus' sub subsequent engagement with uh, Occupy over the following year, um, 
there were some things that uh, uh, I took away from it and got out of it. Uh, so, um, Potipus's subsequent digestion of Occupy helped me to properly situate it as a recrudescence in many ways of the anti-globalization movement um, that emerged after the collapse of the Soviet Union when neo-anarchist currents were attempting to formulate a post-Marxist horizontalist paradigm that substituted resistance in place of reform or revolution. Uh, I learned how the changing administrations from Clinton's in the 1990s, uh, Bush and the Iraq War in the 2000s, and then Obama's presidency had a profound impact on the symptomatic expression of left discontents. Um, in other words, that the passing of the anti-war movement with Obama's election opened the door for the return of the anti-neoliberal left, which had been sidelined by the new lease on life that the Iraq War had given to the anti-imperialist Marxist left. Um, and finally, the Platypus's engagement with neo-anarchism got me to see that Occupy was an opportunity to repose the question of the nature of capitalism and therefore Marxism, perhaps in a more direct way than the uh, focus on imperialism had provided uh, during the anti-war movement. Um, so all this uh, was a far cry from instincts, uh, which were simply to dismiss Occupy as woefully inadequate, which no doubt it was. The difference is that there, uh, that whatever, whatever its inadequacy is, there is something to learn from Occupy about our moment in history. Uh, and without Platypus, I wouldn't have even really thought about it that way at all. Um, so, uh, you know, as I, as I kind of admitted, I, I don't have a ton to say about Occupy, but uh, what I kind of gleaned from the panel description as the main questions uh, were, you know, who is Platypus for? How do we assess our progress? How do we identify our audience? And how do we become a Platypus for them? So uh, I attempted to kind of address these questions at a, at a high level. Uh, so at a basic level, our, our audience is students. Uh, I see this as strategic in several senses. First, because the problem we face is one of the accumulation of ideological obstacles and a discontinuity of historical consciousness. Um, the open-minded desire to learn that college students, uh, and especially undergraduate students, typically harbor makes them a natural audience for Platypus's more circumspect and, and reflective pedagogy. On the flip side, this is what makes those already politicized by the left generally a poor audience for our project, because they tend to lack this required open-mindedness our student mentality. Uh, a second reason uh, this is strategic uh, is, of course, because it's on and around the campuses that the existing left, whether activists or academic, is primarily found. Uh, and therefore, we can make the greatest ideological intervention against the miscegenating practices and pedagogies of the existing left. Uh, we become platypus for our audience when we challenge them to recognize the diminished political horizons of the present day left. Uh, which you know I felt was uh, the kind of formative moment for me when I, I came to Platypus. Uh, so we achieved this by raising uh, the history of the left, and particularly 1917, as a problem to be considered, not as a positive example to be copied, but as the tradition that both revealed and grappled with the problem of overcoming capitalism at the deepest level, hitherto in theory and practice. Um, the point then is to contrast the present day left into relief, to make, to make both our distance from the past and our diminished political horizons palpably felt. This is inevitably frustrating for those who are seeking answers, so this is what to be done now, because what Platypus offers isn't so much knowledge in this sense as an experience, namely to experience the death of the left as a reality in all of its historical gravity. This is also, uh, what makes it difficult to assess our progress as an organization, I believe, uh, because there's no clear means and ends relationship between the cultivations of one's sensibility or the ability to experience a certain reality and actually changing that reality. Um, at most, we can say that recognizing the death of the left in this deeper sense of, of experiencing it is a precondition to actual practical knowledge in its, in its overcoming. Um, perhaps this, this anxiety over this means ends ambiguity. Uh, 
Um, that has led to platypus's various problematic formulations over the years, such as draining the swamp, psychoanalysis of the left, training the next generation of revolutionaries. Um, right, so, so perhaps it's this ambiguity that uh, leads to these formulations. Um, as analogies, each of these phrases provides a way of conceptually closing the gap between means and ends. The patient of, the psych of psychoanalysis is ultimately cured of his neuroses, and clear swamp plans allow for new growth. They are problematic precisely because they imply a direct relationship where there is not. I think that the problems that Platypus faces uh, today is, is related. Um, we always maintain that Plat we've always maintained that Platypus makes a necessary but insufficient contribution in order for the con reconstitution of the left to be possible. Um, and when I first got involved with Platypus, a uh, common formulation was that we sought to reconstitute our object of critique, um, which I took to mean uh, not so much the left itself, transforming the left itself, uh, but that uh, the idea that indirectly platypus uh, may have an effect of um, producing a project that, that would be more, more interesting if still problematic. So, uh, you know, I think in retrospect, uh, the, the few things that have kind of been inspired somewhat by Platypus or influenced at their inception, uh, like, like the Jacobin magazine, um, have been less interesting rather than more. Um, and so, so this really hasn't kind of panned out uh, if it was ever really clear what it meant. Um, so, so, yeah, I guess. Uh, I just want to finish on, on this question that's been raised at the convention this year of, uh, so why still, still do platypus? Um, so I guess my answer to this question is that uh, uh, there's a reason to still do platypus because platypus still remains necessary, even if the other aspects needed for a left to reemerge have not been fulfilled and cannot be fulfilled by Platypus. Taking stock of the present as a product of the left's death and recognizing our distance from past emancipatory horizons both remains necessary, but uh, insufficient as a precondition for the reconstitution of the left today. Um, and, okay, the last thing I want to say is, is that I think there's a lot to be said for, for what uh, Platypus has, has actually accomplished in this regard. Uh, so, we're now several generations removed from our founding cohort, uh, and I continue to be impressed by the uh, younger generation. Uh, and the PR um, is a testament to our organization's ability to register the history of the present, even if it isn't always used to the fullest potential uh, by the membership as a whole. Um, and of course, uh, nurturing a recognition of a problem is precarious undertaking that can simply be considered accomplished in a, in a linear fashion. Um, and so, I, you know, I know that I personally have a greater or lesser degree of uh, awareness of the depth of, of the problems that we're facing as a function of my involvement with Platypus. Um, so, that's all. That's all. So uh, I prepared my remarks uh, in complete ignorance of the prompt and its questions, knowing only the period that I was asked to address. So um, my, my remarks are basically an extended reflection on uh, the passage of uh, Chris's and the ORCOM, uh, I'm sorry, in the members list uh, that, that Spencer quoted in his presentation to the effect that uh, shifts in direction in our project run the risk of throwing off members who have uh, committed themselves to one particular. And make sure you're talking uh, to the microphone. Yeah. Oh, who have committed themselves to one particular uh, area of work. So, um, I've been asked to address the long fourth phase. I take this phase to span roughly from the end of the Occupy Wall Street movement to the beginning of the Sanders campaign for the Democratic Party's 2016 presidential nomination. Occupy emerged in September 2011 and dissipated during the following winter, marking a rough beginning of the fourth phase, 
though the spirit of Occupy was periodically revived uh, throughout the following year, as for example during the efforts to protest the G8 and originally NATO summit uh, held in May 2012 in Chicago. We engaged these efforts during our 2012 convention. Book ending the fourth phase on the opposite side, the Sanders campaign gripped the American left during the second half of 2015. The Democratic Party presidential primary debates were held that October, and Chris's Sandernistas article appeared in the December 2015, January 2016 issue of the PR. Insofar as platypus intersects the left, and the left remains an adjunct of the Democratic Party, which it does, then we can think of our long fourth phase as the consolidation of Obama's second term. It was the period of left accommodation to the Democratic Party center, following the unsuccessful protest of Occupy against that center, trying to change it or move it, and anticipating the unsuccessful bid of Sanders to lead that center. In the wider social and political climate during these years, neoliberalism felt genuinely triumphant. It was Obama's second term. And as one of our members recently put it, the fourth phase felt like the beginning of the thousand year Reich of neoliberalism, <laughs> in which the Bushes, the Clintons, and the Obamas would ensure the dynastic succession of their political and biological progeny for decades <laughs> to come. Despite 2012 predictions of the Republican Party's imminent demographic death, there appeared few options for the Republican Party beyond candidates of the Bush or Romney ilk. And on the opposing side of the culture wars, identity politics seemed to enjoy an unprecedented hegemony. I was asked to review the issues of the PR published during this period. In doing so, I was reminded of one of our greatest self-critiques, that we had failed as a project to engage the Occupy movement sufficiently, perhaps due to our collective academic distaste towards activism or due to our Marxist distaste towards anarchism. We would repeat this self-critique in 2014 during Black Lives Matter. The PR issues published between 2012 and 2015 strike me as, if anything, a belated overcorrection of our third phase shortcomings. Issues of Occupy, anarchism, and anti-austerity politics in Europe appear perhaps more consistently during these years than any other topic in the pages of the PR. We were trying to capture the moment that we felt we had somehow missed. Spencer's interview with Adolf Reed dates to this period as well, and it quickly proved to be the most, or perhaps one of the most, uh, widely read pieces we had published prior to Chris's Why Not Trump article. Was it, was it the most? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Sunnis, been on review. That might have been on Okay. Um, despite their apparent dissimilarity, what these two topical engagements, Occupy and Adolf Reed, share in common is an attention to questions of political economy amidst the neoliberal zenith, whether that of finance capital or of race, two fixtures of the Obama presidency. The fourth phase also stands out in my mind as the period during which perhaps five to 10 of our members, a few prominent and others less so, left the organization, one was expelled, first to form the extant Society for Psychoanalytic Inquiry, and then to disperse into various subsequent projects. The political trajectories of these ex-members illuminate a divide on the left that deepened over the course of the fourth phase a divide between anarchism inflected identity politics and social democracy inflected welfare laborism. One ex-member, perhaps the most vocal in his critique of Platypus as an internally authoritarian organization, undertook various attempts to found communal intentional living spaces of artists and cultural producers, including one here in Hyde Park in Chicago, and also created an art project supposedly seeking to convince Kanye West to run for mayor of Chicago. By the end of the fourth phase, however, he had relocated to East Asia, where his livelihood would be less implicated in the perpetuation of the white settler colony to which he had been born. Indeed, by this time, he could be found on Facebook accusing his fellow ex platypus friends of belonging to a racist, imperialist, white supremacist organization. And he was referring, of course, to the Democratic Socialists of America. Even the fracture of our ex-members then manifested in extreme fashion the factional contestation unfolding within the Democratic Party during the long fourth phase. Though I was nearly dragged along with this small exodus, 
uh, the organizational and political critiques of Platypus on which it was based did not ultimately convince me. I redoubled my membership and helped to generate two initiatives, uh, two panel series. Third parties on the left, effectively raising the question of electoral work on the left, and the politics of work, engaging the political implications of various discourses around technological unemployment. At the time, I conflated the question of political party as such with the question of electoral work in a misunderstanding of the political party as electoralist in nature. I also, via Postone, took Platypus to share a perspective according to which increasing technological unemployment, I should say probably through a partial, at least partial misreading of Postone, uh, according to which uh, increasing technological unemployment would make it politically possible and necessary for Marxists to demand that the state guarantee full employment, shorter working hours, and a guaranteed minimum income. Despite everything I had learned in the reading group, especially about the Second International, in other words, it was nearly impossible for me to imagine or conceptualize a political party for socialism organizing civil society and building power on that basis and seeking to take state power on that basis. I would only gain something of this understanding later via pedagogy and platypus around the socialist turn. But at that time, I was using the tools of our project, especially uh, the panel format, to try to understand why we weren't content to follow Jacobin Magazine into the DSA. In retrospect, my engagements with Platypus were manifesting the tectonic political shifts taking place during the long fourth phase, perhaps more than I realized. For although I described the consolidation of Obama's second term as a kind of neoliberal zenith, it was also the period of neoliberal crisis, expressed politically as well as ideologically. It was no accident that most of our ex-members, most of them, in other words, with a few exceptions, uh, eventually gravitated to the DSA. And I would say ex-members of Platypus, specifically, um, who had gone through our second phase pedagogy. It's no accident that these people eventually uh, gravitated to the DSA, specifically, and not to third worldist anarchism. This happened for the same reason that our Adolf Reed interview proved so popular when it was published in 2015. The official multiculturalism of the Democratic Party Center could only keep its progressive and labor constituencies from growing restive for so long. During the fourth phase, many of our members attended the Jacobin Magazine reading groups, which brought recent postgrads, young academics, and young professionals, often working in nonprofit and social service organizations, together, and this was happening across the country. Discussion frequently turned to the successes and failures of anti austerity political parties in Europe mainly Syriza and, to a lesser extent, Podemos. The Jacobin Reading Group imagination was typically one of incubating such a party within the Democratic Party, either to transform the party itself or to, ven to eventually break away and form a new party. Such a new party uh, would, would, or such a formation, any such formation, would capture the discontents of the occupied generation and would wield them in defense of the welfare state and against austerity. The ex-members who have since joined the DSA uh, and taken up something like this perspective, often capping the horizons of their political aims at the eventual emergence of a labor party in the United States, uh, came to characterize Platypus as a sectarian organization, undertaking educational work but lacking any sense of political vision or organizational know-how that could even possibly become actionable in our lifetimes. To them, we were or are an incipiently political project that would never actually affect its desired vision. They themselves, however, could practice the Marxist politics that Platypus merely preached. After all, uh, Platypus desired no political activity in the present, um, and so it must be content on some level, implicitly, though never avowedly, to leave the political field to the social democrats. What would socialist politics look like in the present if not working for socialism within the labor movement and to defend the welfare state? The party question would grow out of that work, so they thought. This points to the greatest risk we encountered as a project during this period, that we were simply arming and equipping people intellectually to take up the cudgels of the social democratic laborist side within the Democratic Party's intensified internecine faction feud between its ethnic or racial community constituency groups and its welfarist labor movement wings. The left thought it knew which side we were on, after all, with Reed, Mitchell, D'Amelio, and Adorno on our syllabus. All, all critics in some fashion raising critiques of identity politics. 
uh, we had gained a reputation for being the most theoretically sophisticated critics of identity politics on the American left. I was even asked once by a hostile uh, but aggressively polite Jacobin uh, reading group organizer if the rumor was true that Platypus planned to take over the labor movement. <laughs> But notice, no one ever would ask us, right, if we plan to take over uh, identity-based ethnic constituency organizing. Um, no one would even think that we would do that. Um, many of our members had either written for or played some staff role in Jacobin, and one of our longtime members now serves on the staff of Catalyst. Indeed, uh, even Bhaskar Sankara was attracted to Platypus early on and had some brush with our pedagogy while preparing to become a left entrepreneur. Uh, do you plan to address the uh, uh, Chicago Socialist Party at all? No, okay. concrete. Okay. Socialist well, um, maybe this will come up in the Q and A. But I just also wanted to mention that this was the period during which a number of Platypus members uh, became involved in the uh, something called the Chicago Socialist Campaign, that was uh, sparked by the success of Kshama Sawant in electing, uh, uh, in in gaining a uh, Seattle City Council seat. Uh, and this was an initiative of Socialist Alternative. And uh, it, it, it ended up being here in Chicago a practical uh, left unity project in the sense that around uh, the campaign's decision uh, ultimately not to uh, take Chris up on his offer to run for alderman in Uptown under the banner of the campaign, but, uh, but to run uh, Jorge Mujica. Uh, for a different aldermanic race here in Chicago. On that basis, a number of left groups here in Chicago, like the ISO, the DSA, Socialist Alternative, and Solidarity, were able to forge this kind of loose organizational cooperation, all hoping that they would be able to pick up, you know, perhaps each other's members, or you know, newly politicized progressives, or um, you know, perhaps some Occupy remnants that had gravitated to the campaign. Um, but when the question was posed to, to Socialist Alternative at the Labor Notes conference following the campaign, um, what, what everyone should do on that basis uh, now that the campaign was over, and if, it, if, if Socialist Alternative would lead the gathered forces to create the Chicago Socialist Party on the basis of the Chicago Socialist campaign, Socialist Alternative said, no, what you should do is join Socialist Alternative. Um, so um, now, obviously, that's, um, that reveals a lot of limitations, li limitations. But I think one, one thing that it showed is that um, there were, those limitations were to the CPGB model, right, of left unity on a programmatic basis. But the, the groups did work together when they thought they could get something out of the activist milieu, the organizing work that was being done. Um, they did it self-servingly for their own organizations, but they actually still ended up doing it to a degree that was kind of remarkable here in Chicago at that time. Um, lastly, I, I just have two more paragraphs. Um, I would say these remarks uh, reflect, above all, my own political recollections of the fourth phase. It is perhaps overdetermined uh, that these recollections would focus on the DSA and Jacobin, and the way in which our project became unconsciously caught up in the Democratic Party's internecine social democracy versus identity politics factional conflict. I'm a white guy from the suburbs. I've spent my entire life in Platypus as a postgraduate worker. I've spent most of my life working in the public sector and in the academy. Most of my friends work in schools and nonprofits. So whatever happens to the professional managerial class happens to my milieu and therefore to me, unfortunately. Um, and, and this certainly includes the American left's uh, fourth phase era preparations to attempt to reconstitute progressive welfare laborism within the Democratic Party. Uh, so I realize that I've addressed the fourth phase in a limited fashion and from a kind of provincially American perspective as well. But I think the phenomena I've described are at least part of the story of our organization in the fourth phase. Um, an organization holding its 10th annual convention can no longer claim to stand apart from or prior to the status quo division of labor on the left. I now, looking back, remember the fourth phase as one during which Platypus during which the platypus critique of platypus turned on the fact that we had helped to produce some of the sharpest members of the Democratic Socialists of America. Would this become our default drift, disavowed but de facto? Or would we consciously interrupt it at the level of our pedagogy? I see our socialist turn as, among other things, marking our definitive embrace of the latter path. 
This has allowed us to become a platypus for our audience once again. Yeah, I'm just gonna get into it. Can you hear me? What does it mean to say that platypus is the psychoanalyst of the left? Thinking through this analogy can provide some clarity about the platypus project and its relationship to the existing left. Freud never had a prescriptive conception of health. In fact, for Freud, mental health existed on a spectrum of degree and was not a difference in kind. In other words, for Freud, the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy psyche was not a difference in two different kinds of psyches, but a difference in how the psyches express different degrees of mental illness on a spectrum. For Freud, we are all neurotic, repressed, and pathological. The question is, to what degree? There is no sharp line of division between health and, health and illness, but only a, spe a spectrum of gradations. Freud didn't have a predetermined concept of health, but recognized that we were all healthy and unhealthy at the same time, and this expressed itself in symptoms to varying degrees. If Platypus is a psychoanalyst of the left, this patient's health or illness must be conceptualized the same way. The left is not ill according to a pre-established idea of health, an abstract schema used to measure the left's vitality. There is no sharp line dividing the left's illness from its health, its death from when it was alive or its potential rebirth. Platypus has no pre predetermined idea of what a truly living or healthy left would look like. That is why to say that the left is dead is not simply a moral condemnation of the exi existing left for failing to meet abstract criteria of being healthy or alive. Rather, the left is ill or dead according to its own history in relation to what it once was and what it imagined itself to be. Yet, of course, perhaps this is far from self-evident, at least for the left. For Freud, the point of psychoanalysis was not to simply declare to the patient that they are ill or get the patient to recognize objective truth outside of their subjectivity or to provide answers for their health, but to engage in a process where the, pa where the patient comes to recognize and become self-conscious of their own pathology, their own illness. We have no prescription for what ails the left. All we can do is work through the symptoms of this illness. This is, thus, it is important to note that the different, phrase, the different phases in the platypus project are not, are not marked by platypus' own preoccupation in the abstract or what we think the left should be talking about. Rather, our phases are marked by the historically shifting symptoms expressed by the left itself, the patient's own preoccupations. In demarcating different phases in platypus, we are merely trying to objectify the different orientations and positions the left has taken in the last decade that are the most acute symptoms expressing the left's illness. This should be kept in mind when addressing the latest phase in, plat latest phase in platypus, the socialist turn. The rise of socialist rhetoric and sentiment on the left seems to many a sign of optimism, an expression of the left's growth, an expression of a potential new life for leftism and socialism. Platypus sees things differently. We recognize the left's changing preoccupations, like the return of socialism we are seeing now, are only different symptoms expressing the death of the left. However, like Freud, we have to address these symptoms as neither inevitable nor unchangeable, nor unreal or merely subjective, simply a product of the patient's own delusions. We have to deal with these symptoms as very real and a product and constituent of objectivity, but also as changeable, as something that can be overcome. This is what we mean when we say in Platypus that the existing left might be an obstacle to socialism. Its solutions to the problem are the symptoms of its irrelevance. They, they, they themselves express the problem. But there's no way around this. We are all expressions of the problem to a more or less self-conscious degree. If Rosa, Lust, if Rosa Luxemburg was accurate in her prognosis 100 years ago that the choice was between socialism and barbarism, then we, then we must concede that the last 100 years of social life have been barbaric. We are a product of the counter-revolution. We are all expressions of a barbaric world. We all express symptoms of a world without a left. The question is what to do about it. Faced with a similar situation of barbarism in the 1930s, Walter Benjamin wrote in Experience in Poverty, barbarism, yes indeed. We say this in order to introduce a new positive concept of barbarism. What would it mean to recognize the positive aspect, the potential of our barbaric moment? It would mean registering how this barbarism could be transformed on the basis of the barbarity itself. There is no way around, but only through. The problem with the millennial left is that it, is that it doesn't take the progressive, character of the progressive character of barbarism seriously enough. 
It doesn't take the progressive character of the barbaric present seriously enough. It expresses moral outrage at the world as it is, with, near, with no real prospects of changing it. It affirms its own impotence as a, as a criterion for a correct ideology. And yet the world changes. The left is content in expressing outrage at the character of these changes that seem to happen from above, without recognizing how their own discontents are bound up with the changes themselves. The recent socialist turn is an expression of the left's fundamental inability, inability to deal with changes that happen in capitalism. Social, socialism in this context is framed as anti-capitalism, as resistance to the powers that be. In other words, socialism means resisting Trump. Socialism means resisting the changes that are, bring, that are being brought about in society. Socialism is no longer an expression of the desire for the new or different, as much as a desire for a return to an imagined more equitable status quo. I really recently saw a left-wing meme that said FDR was a democratic socialist. And I, this just made me think of that socialism is no more about a desire for the new and different, but that the, like the welfare set is an example of the status quo we need to return to. As Chris C. put it in a recent article in the Platypus Review, the millennial left was not defeated by Bush, Obama, Hillary, or Trump. No, they have consistently defeated themselves. They failed to ever even become themselves as something distinctly new and different, but instead continued the same old 90, 1980s modus operandi inherited from the failure of the 1960s new left. The millennial left's lack of historical self-consciousness spells its doom. It repeats history without recognizing it. It remains tethered to past moments in the grim history of the defeat of the left without self-awareness about this fact. The millennial left did not point a way forward out of the dead-end projects of a new left in postmodernism, but rather inherited and naturalized these failed ideological enterprises with their limited political horizons as their intellectual backdrop. The irony is that the millennial left thinks that its socialism is something new, a Marxism 2.0, updated with the struggles of a plethora of oppressed identities previously neglected. Intersectionality is viewed as a novel concept. But perhaps the millennial left is not new enough. It unconsciously reproduces intellectual frameworks that were not only inherited from past moments in the history of the defeat of the left, but that themselves were products of even earlier defeats. Historical regression, mean, me, historical regression means a continued inheritance of lower and lower pro political horizons and possibilities. The real tragedy is that this unconscious repetition of in inheriting lowered political horizons is celebrated as the new. The millennial left affirms this condition of lowered, lowered political horizons and possibility and rejoices in its own impotence. Politics is reduced to a question of abstract morality or ethics, expressions of identity. Socialism is reduced to a lifestyle, an alternative way of living according to an abstract set of socialist principles. The question of actually fundamentally transforming the world is completely bracketed because it is thought impossible. Thus, the socialist turn, far from an expression of a renewed strength on the left, is a symptom of the left's continued helplessness and impotence in the face of circumstances it has participated in creating, but that confronted as something foreign and alien. This is the real pathology of the left. It continually reconstitutes the domination it wants to overcome precisely on the basis of its discontents against this domination. What would it mean to overcome this pathology? Platypus has no answer in regards to what this would look like. All we can do like Freud is attempt, is attempt to provoke recognition in the patient of its pathology. Freud's goal was to strengthen the ego of the patient through self-consciousness. If the patient could be made conscious of the pathology, perhaps that would point to its overcoming. We seek to incite the same kind of self-recognition and self-overcoming on the left. Freud's goal was to increase the patient's freedom through self-mastery. Our goal is the same for the history of humanity. Okay, we're going to skip the responses because everybody just kind of took more time. We're going to go straight to the Q&A. Um, so. Patrick. <laughs> Sorry, um, just before the panel, I was talking to Ed, and we're going to be asking questions about phases. And I was saying, like, we were talking about phases, and I was thinking, like, well, I don't, I've always not made that much attention to phases. But one of the things I was thinking about was 
that um, I had the feeling before Trump's election that if Trump was elected, that would constitute a fifth phase. And I've been somewhat surprised by the sense that it doesn't really feel like we're in the fifth phase. So instead of the term fifth phase, we've used like the term second decade. But I'm wondering like whether you feel that in some sense we're out of the fourth phase into a new phase or not. I guess maybe it looks like this is off. I mean, do you feel that someone who was recruited after Trump was elected is experiencing essentially a new phase of politics or not? Or is it still basically what the fourth phase or fourth and a half phase of politics? Well, I, I was thinking about this with respect to the growth uh, of the DSA, the Sanders campaign and the growth of the DSA. Um, because I think in Platypus, we've, my understanding is that we've tried to track our phases not so much on a purely internal basis, but on the basis of the phases of the left. Um, so all I'll say is what seems kind of interesting to me about our moment is that the left has, it seems to have changed somewhat considerably, although in the long view, we predict this to be a bubble, and we're probably right. Um, but in the short term right now, um, I, I would say that at least the American left feels different with the DSA at you know, something like 30,000 members or wh wherever it stands. Um, and I'm not sure exactly whether or how our members are um, intersecting that. Um, but I think, you know, again, insofar as the left is an adjunct of the Democratic Party and there are some real changes, um, or at least attempted changes taking place within the Democratic Party, I think that's where we would want to look to answer that question. But I, I don't have a definitive answer. I was going to say, um, yeah, I'm also kind of fuzzy on the importance of the phases, but there's one thing that um, I notice, I guess, as someone who was in the project at the beginning, is just the, um, the loss of the new left as an interlocutor for the project. Um, because I guess at the beginning of the project, we kind of riding a certain anti-new left sentiment um, that was around. And you're noticing this there that continues in a way where people don't um, understand as much that the new left had a very higher horizon for politics than um, current movements and also had a much more <coughs> rich and sophisticated um, intellectual milieu than we're able to replicate as a group. Um, and so there's a bit, I, I think that um, is a slightly more distant realization that people have now. As we've sort of, we, we tend to emphasize in our pedagogy, we, we make the leap more into the second international. But um, I just remember our engagements with people um, from the new left, and those have been our most fruitful, ultimately, to me. I mean, it's something I try to address in my talk, which I just touched on, right? But that the phases really are about the left and the left's own preoccupations, not platypus is like what the left should be talking about or something. And so in terms of the fourth and the half phase or the Trump phenomenon, uh, I, what I was also trying to articulate is that the socialist phenomenon, the D rise of the DSA, uh, the Bernie Sanders phenomenon, is all about, it's like a response to the crisis of neoliberalism, which for people is expressed in Trump. So the, I just seems, it doesn't seem like it necessitates a new phase as much as it expresses what the left was already kind of banking on, uh, which is the expression of the cri like how does it, the crisis of neoliberalism liberal express itself? It expresses itself through Trump, and that socialism is the answer to Trump. It's really about Trump. So I don't, to me, I don't know if that necessitates a new phase in the sense that I think Trump really uh, deepens or substantiates the left's claims to socialism. Um. I guess I would say that in you know, early on, uh, there was the question of the sectarian left, um, or there was the presence of the sectarian left, 
uh, which definitely was the way that the new left appeared to us, uh, was the groups that were on the left, particularly in the anti-war movement. And that frustration with the kind of intractability of that sectarian environment was, an, I think, an originary experience of platypus. Uh, but it gradually posed itself as the party question, which I don't think it quite did early on, um, but it's definitely been, a, you know, on the one hand, I, I think you can see the pedagogy of the of ten years of the first decade of platypus really being, uh, it, you know, at one level a red thread in it is the emergence of that question very plainly, and I think that you know, also relates to the issue of the. Uh, campaign for a socialist party, etc. Uh, as far as the second phase is concerned, uh, you could see that in the, um, because I do want to stick to sort of my remit, um, the Politics of Critical Theory panel with Richard Westermann uh, and Andrew Feenberg and, and Chris, where the discussion of Lukacs really became a question about political form. Uh, in a way that, um, you know, really the discussion of Lukacs prior to that, you know, I had never experienced that, certainly, uh, you know, from, from the kind of new left uh, treatment uh, that, through which I had received him. And so it came up, you know, in and through our engagement with Marxism as well as uh, through our attempts to instantiate our project in relationship to the left and to engage the left. And I think that you know, obviously the election of Trump is, you know, the frustration was, you know, on the one hand it's very clear that the millennials are not going to be sectarians. Um, and, and on the other hand, um, you know, they're, even the sectarians were all Democrats um, in 2016, you know, very plainly. And so the total liquidation of of, of the left became very palpable and in that sense um, you know the diminishing way in, in which you could recover a kind of deeper uh, new left sensibility of you know the way in which the sectarian left at least as frustrating as it was preserved a certain kind of memory uh, and and now we see that really kind of just falling into incoherence um, so in, in that sense, you know, I, it hasn't been a fifth phase so, so much as a second decade to me. Hello. Uh, so I guess on, on the psychoanalysis analogy, I was kind of wondering, I think it's a good analogy, but it kind of raises the question of who the audience is or who the patient is. It's like with Freud, the patient is the person that he's psychoanalyst. I think with us, the question is, are, as I hear people say, you know, we're not necessarily, our audience isn't necessarily the left itself. And maybe, maybe it's students or the general public. So I guess that question would be kind of still, who is the primary audience of this kind of psychoanalysis or investigation, not to get too caught up on the metaphor, but, and then also, does this change with our phases? Like, are these phases just kind of like recognitions of history, or does it change not only our goals, but like who we're trying to reach and, and intervene with? It? That's my question. I mean, I think on one level, uh, well, I was going to say one thing about the analogy is that obviously. You there's a lot of holes in it in the sense that like psychoanalysis I don't think is applicable to like a social body in the same way as an individual. It's not easily translatable. But I think the point I would make is that the patient really is society, right? And that the left, all the left is to us, or what it once was, was the most acute symptoms of society. That social, uh, the, pa the social body as a patient would be expressed most acutely through the left. And I think we still hold that to be the case that, you know, it's not as interesting to like talk to the right. Um, that they don't express the symptoms as acutely, perhaps. Um, I feel like other people would have things to say more concretely about our audience. So. I would just say that addressing students and recruiting students is 
is addressing the left. Um, because this, the left, like us, are, you know, vampiric. You know, you live off of the young. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, um, you know, you, you have to recruit young people. Uh, and by trying to, in a sense, interpose ourselves uh, between the left and the ability to reproduce the education, you know, to, to educate a new generation, uh, to, invite, to be the ones who issue the invitations onto campus, uh, and to be a constant presence in their engagement with the young, uh, we are directly addressing the left. Uh, you know, these are not unrelated. That's all I would point out. Maybe uh, just to specify that a little bit, um, I think thinking of our project as one that takes up the problems and tasks of Marxism, we have to be very sober about the state of Marxism in our world today and its uses and abuses. By whom is it used and abused? It's, well, the ac activist and academic left. If you want to prepare a young person to you know, hit the pavement, to um, be a labor organizer, or to um, you know, support some kind of um, ethnic-based community organization, and they're interested in becoming a little bit more radical, you're going to give them perhaps some Lenin, right? Like whether you're in the DSA or the RCP or, or what have you. And those are just two examples um, that come to mind. But this is a kind of patented part of our of social reproduction in our world, um, and Marxism plays a certain role in it. Um, and we intervene at that level. So I think it's very acutely pitched in a sense. Um, and when I look at like how and why people have actually come to our project, I think it basically relates to those phenomena. They've been um, politicized and had some interest in Marx, uh, Marxism, socialism, Leninism, what have you, either through their professors or through um, activists and organizing work, um, all of which falls under the umbrella of the Democratic Party today. Um, so we have our work cut out for us in that sense, as long as that remains the case. Here? Okay. I was wondering if you could speak about the international growth of Platypus, because um, especially the, I don't know, by the time I joined, there was already an international presence, and I kind of take it for granted, and I'm wondering how that's, that's shifted, or whether that's you know, obviously presented challenges and further opportunities. So if you're um, maybe, maybe I'll address that. I'm not necessarily the best person for this, but um, uh, I think that's, that was actually something that was unexpected, but is also just a part of the natural, um, I don't know, cross-section of global student, you know, life. <laughs> you know, people, uh, you know, like our, our growth to Germany, which was the, kind of the first place that we had a lot of, I guess, international growth in, was just because um, some people in Germany, you know, studied in Chicago and did a Google search, like I think Chicago Adorno, I think was the Google search when we showed up. Um, and they, uh, <laughs> you know, started coming to our reading group. So I, it's funny because I don't think the uh, international growth has been like, it's not pre-planned. I actually very, not really any platypus growth has been exactly pre-planned where we've been like, you know, next year France or something like that. <laughs> That would be great if we could do that kind of thing. But um, most of it has just been, um, I think, something that already kind of happens with how events take place on the left. Um, you know, I, I think it's not coincidental that people in Greece became interested at the particular time that they did. Um, same with Germany, actually. There, there was a lot to do with the, um, the collapse of these like anti-Deutsch milieus. Um, was the reason why people were, were um, looking at platypus. And similarly, too, we had a lot of engagements with um, the Iranian left at a particular time um, at Carta. I mean, the thing is that, is that the U.S. is a, you know, international phenomenon, and its university structure is an international phenomenon, and we just, uh, by product of 
focusing on students uh, in that. I mean, I would also talk about um, this, you know, the spread to Great Britain, uh, the way that, um, you know, I don't, I, it's, it's remarkable when you look back at, at old issues of the left, um, you know, people like James Hartfield and, and, and David Black really presenting themselves to engage uh, with platypus, uh, presumably through the internet. Um, you know, I think James wrote in issue nine, uh, and, <coughs> and, and David responded to Chris's piece on Korsh circa issue 16 or 17, so that's around 2000. Eight or early nine, I guess, um, and and so, you know, when when Lucy went there, um, you know, obviously she didn't have, you know, we, we couldn't hand her a bunch of recruits, uh, but she did have a sense of of the left there, and and people <coughs> that she could invite onto panels and so forth. I mean, obviously Lucy's the expert on the. Uh, on, on the transplant to, to Britain, but I would say that you know, despite all the, you know, the, the dramatic success in Germany, uh, we've had a, an immense success in Great Britain. I'm sure as painful as that's been for Lucy, uh, when you look at the history of the panels that they've put on uh, and, and the quality of members that we've had uh, coming out of Britain, you know, that's an extremely important uh, side of that international extension of platypus. But I guess. Uh, I would just add, because this fascinates me, um, it's also our spread in the U.S., because that's also been kind of slow moving and happened at, at different moments. And actually, we had more international growth than we had U.S. <coughs> growth uh, for a while. <coughs> so uh, our U.S. growth has been more recent than that. Um, California may be considered international. California is <laughs> 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 um, the South. And the South yeah, now, a little bit. Um, and that's probably similar actually to the way that the um, DSA has emerged and that there's a wider milieu in the U.S. for um, a conversation about uh, what politics probably. Hi. So very much as usual appreciate the thoughts here and also, I appreciate the self-criticism aspect of folks from Platypus in reconsidering former positions that oneself had taken. And that, I think, is really valuable and is different in a lot of ways and is very welcome and refreshing in a way, as long as it stays honest in that. Um, my question has to do with how one is defining the left. I know you've written a lot about that, but it's being used in several different ways here. So we'd say the left today feels this, or is thinking this, or is taking this position. And I don't recognize some of that in the milieu that I run in. And so I'm wondering how you define that, first of all. What are the, cat what are the I mean, you talked about Bernie Sanders' campaign as part of the left, or people in it at DSA and Jacobin, but what about monthly review? What about things that you haven't mentioned? There are other, many other magazines, journals, collectives, science for the people, which are all leftists at one point. So how do you intersect with that? And also, that, and that brings me to a question about the ecology movement, which is huge, and there are many, many different tendencies within that. And it seems it's just right for people to take for, it doesn't deal with the, usually the questions of class at all, but it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate that either. I mean, it's open for that type of discussion in those movements. So I was wondering, um, has Platypus addressed the questions of ecology and, and the future of this planet and of complex life on this planet? I was going to say that you are sitting by someone who wrote an article on bees and Marxism. And I asked if they contributed to a book that I'm putting out in September. Oh, perfect. 
Um, so now you're stuck. I think. Well, I mean, part of it is um, a matter of geography that we meet certain people. Obviously, we started in Chicago, so there were certain milieus that um, we were closer to then. And you know, in Santa Cruz, for example, that's where the founder of like Food Not Bombs is, who was on a recent uh, um, fora there. So you know, he's heavily involved in uh, ecology, and, uh, food, um, these kinds of issues. So some of it, I think, is just the character of what our students perceive as the left, and we take them as honest observers of that and use the um, topics and um, leaders or intellectuals or whatever that they intersect to fill out our events. And obviously we have certain weaknesses in that depending on the different kinds of milieus that we are able to make with the students that we meet. Um, but I think we've also at times made like conscious turns in direction where we thought that we were um, weak. And I give one example that um, Really, I guess in some sense it was led by Spencer, which is that we did we spent a good amount of time looking at uh, the new communist movement, for example. And at the time, I wasn't really even sure why we would ever do that. I was like, <laughs> we just did the '60s. Why would we do the new communist movement? Um, but uh, that actually turned out to be a really um, more interesting than expected um, engagement for us at the particular time that we did it and. Um, strengthened our understanding of particular um, problems of party building and what people thought when they went back to Marxism. Um, so I guess that's maybe a tangential um, answer to your question. The one about what is the meaning of the left, I mean, we also, I guess, address that from a kind of like philosophical level and in the most, in sort of the broadest sense of, um, you know, the bourgeois revolutions, the French Revolution, American Revolution, and what's the consequences of of those uh, that sort of political introduction to the world of capitalism? I think it's good that we also address it on that philosophical level and not, um, you know, specifically Marxist or something like that, um, because it allows us to uh, give students the ability to intersect all these different kinds of milieus, like ecology, etc., and bring those questions. I think others might have thoughts, but um, two examples come to mind. Uh, I, I, I take your point. I take your question. I think it's a good one. Two examples come to mind uh, for me. One is Adolf Reed, and the other is um, some monthly review readers of the New Left Generation that I've known in Chicago. Uh, I think in Platypus, there was some, you know, even though we should know better by now, there was some collective, a feeling of collective disappointment when Adolf Reed... Um, came out and endorsed uh, Clinton in the 2016 election. Because what that revealed, all of his retrospective, uh, all of his prior critiques to have been, uh, uh, were uh, effectively negotiating, you know, bargaining. Um, but at the end of the day, he found himself, you know, as an avowed sort of pop frontist back there. And so, um, you know, back, back endorsing the Democratic Party Center. Um, and so uh, I, I think what that pointed to was the way in which even the new left generation critics, um, when, when there arose a kind of popular or uh, you know, seemingly spontaneous popular movements on the left, like the Sanders campaign, got pulled into that and actually blunted the edge of their critique. They actually, you know, from, from the perspective of political and historical education, they got worse, and, uh, and and in that sense, abdicated some of the responsibility. You know that we collectively took them to be taking up during previous times when there seemed to be less uh, a activism, perhaps going on for them to intersect. I uh, before I came to Platypus, I was in uh, a reading group with some new left generation radicals here in Chicago, and I learned a lot from them. Um, and and monthly review articles often. Uh, appear uh, on, on the, the reading group list. I did not track those folks 
uh, you know, during the period when the Jacobin magazine reading groups proliferated. But I can only suspect that I would have learned a lot less from them had I been sitting in the room in the Jacobin reading group with them than I did years earlier, right? Because again, they blunted their critique. Here are all these millennials. We have to appeal to them. We have to kind of soften our position to compromise with their political horizons. Um, I'm not saying that it's impossible, you know, to to do that sort of educational work without um, without making such compromises. But that's what I suspect has happened, um, and I've I've heard reports of that. And I think Reed is kind of a more prominent example. Um, but I think there are probably hundreds of thousands of more everyday examples um, on the left today uh, of that. So I take your point, but um, you know, even from the horizons of the best of the new left, I think you know we've seen in in this period. Um, somewhat of a lowering of, of horizons. I wanted to ask about the Occupy moment as a kind of disorienting period for Platypus. Um, at the time, I was in New York, and I was just recently talking to a member of Nunzia about my experience in Occupy New York and how how bizarre it was, and how you know we would so to paint the scene, we'd like end up in these quote-unquote salons in the Upper West Side with people doing like lines of coke in the back and like hanging out and like, you know, like arguing about like what prank they could pull off in Sakoti Park and it was like Alex Kalinico's um, grandson was there and Laura Penny was there and like, and I was like, what do I do? Like how am I a platypus member here? Like what's my intervention going to be about? Um, and, you know, like I remember like reading Adolf Reed's um, Listen Liberal because we all had to bring in like something to read and like, and it was just very confusing actually and I was thinking about how you put it Tom, like the, the change and the kind of like unpreparedness of the change and I remember when we were in the anti-war movement like in Chicago, the way that we talked to the Spartacists, the way that I felt at my best as a Platypus member was when I like knew what their positions were during the 1970s and the Iranian Revolution, and I could like read back to them, look, you have this serious position and your current like perspective on you know on our <coughs> present doesn't correspond to like your insights here. But with these people, with the anarchists of Occupy, it's like they didn't take themselves seriously enough to be to be sort of intersected at the level of politics. And in some respects, like we're still inheriting that kind of a political left, um, and it's really difficult how to, as we say in Platypus, like squeeze the blood out of the turnip, and how to turn that kind of left into a potential object lesson for Platypus. And so, in some regards, like we're still kind of stuck in that like disorienting post-occupied confusion. Um, and yeah, and I just wanted to hear what you guys thought, like what to do with that, or if if it's something we can quote unquote avoid or if it's something that, in some respects, we need to come to terms with. Um, so, maybe this is like too easy of an answer, but uh, I guess I found that, uh, yeah, at the time I had, I had this kind of same experience where I'd go to Occupy and we wouldn't really know how to talk to people there. Um, but uh, I actually think that a lot of the um, engagements that Platypus organized afterwards, uh, like the interview with David Graeber, and we had uh, uh, some panels. Um, if you actually read those, they're, they're uh, you know, the participants are, are well thought out and, and reflective, and you get like a pretty good sense of what the kind of, the, the actual like history and kind of ideological motivations of the organizers of Occupy. It's just that at the protests themselves, uh, you know, there, it wasn't easy to kind of like identify these people really, like you might be able to find the Spartans at an anti-war protest in the same way. Um, so I think that like, I guess this is why, one of the reasons I didn't kind of connect the dots here, but one of the reasons why I was kind of pointing in on this question of like the audience uh, in, in my talk is that this was a point of confusion for me at the time. It was like, okay, uh, you know, who's, who is the audience for Platypus in the context of something like Platypus? Are we trying to go there and uh, you know create some sort of audience for ourselves at Occupy? You know, uh, and I think in retrospect, like no, uh, you know we go to Occupy uh, with you know contacts um, to like 
expose them to less as we would do with any sort of uh, uh, kind of activism. Um, and then it's really by bringing uh, the kind of organizers to campus that we can can actually get a more productive, reflective kind of uh, uh, engagement out of them. Um, but like that's not to uh, you know that's not to 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 downplay or belittle your point, which I think is valid about you know. Um, the ability to kind of go back through this artist's history in, in that very uh, kind of concrete way um, and, and engage with them on that basis. Uh, it, it's there, but it, it's there to a lesser degree in, in the Occupy movement, from my impression, sorry. I would just say that it, it relates to, to Mitchell's question about, you know, Occupy taught us something about the left, what is the left? You know, what does it mean to recognize anarchism as the left? And also to think about that problem historically. I mean, it taught, I remember, you know, the, the, in a sense, the two major comments in our own pedagogy. You know, Adorno talking about anarchism as a ghost, as the reappearance of a ghost uh, in uh, signaling the failure of Marxism in the 60s and of course the, the much more acute analysis or, or pointed analysis of Lenin uh, about the anarchism representing a, a, a critique of the statism of the SPD and of, Marx, of second international Marxism more generally uh, in, in state and revolution and the you know the problem that I think we had in Occupy was to try to get the and I think this is what you're pointing to is to try to get the anarchists to in a sense evince that critique of the failure of Marxism you know in a way that we could recognize and and, and engage. I mean I think we're also trying to deal with the absence of politics, right? So trying to make these people recognize that what they think is politics is a symptom of reduced expectations, right? Um, and, and so I think it does come up in the socialist turn in interesting ways, right? The lifestyle, which I think is just anarchism in some sense, right? The lifestyleism, the moral critiques of capitalism, how can I live better to alleviate the problems of capitalism? And yeah, and so to elucidate like that this is just an absence of politics, that your conception of politics itself is uh, a, a result of a kind of failure in history on the left. Um, you know, and I, I, I like that Moish piece, History and Helplessness, be, and just in terms of thinking about things that seem inevitable on the left as symptoms of helplessness, right? That was really helpful to me to like, how is, you know, how is like anarchism and like it's kind of comedic aspects an expression of helplessness? Um, and to make that, I agree with Tom that it's more about getting our audience to think about that in terms of thinking about the left rather than getting an occupier anarchist person to think about it. Another thing that comes up in Cincinnati, right, so they do like a prison abolition reading group, but at the same time, you know, you hear calls to jail the rapist and jail the killer cops, right? And so Bryce asked a question about this kind of contradiction at DSA reading group, and his like summary of the response was like, well, of course we're not going to actually do this, right? So it doesn't matter. Like, it's purely like, of course we have no power to abolish prison. So it's purely just like, like moral like, expressions of outrage. And so to say that, like, look, this isn't politics. This is just... Uh, existential crises of like living under capitalism like but we have to like it is like a complicated thing that you have to point to something that was politics to say that this isn't politics which might be coming more and more difficult um I, I might be repeating what other people have said but um i for example um during the anti-war period and also just in my own development of sort of figuring out what marxism is um you know i looked dismissively at anarchism, and I had an idea that, um, you know, well, as I was mentioning in my initial remarks, that, you know, labor solidarity and labor unions, that, that's like more serious, that would be like, that's like a higher, you know, there's like this kind of hierarchy, and that's like way above, or whatever, anarchism, that's like labor unions, and um, I think it's, it's been like a slow um, process of, Kind of seeing the different um, 
how the different types of less leftism um, get at certain issues better. So, uh, you know, I was very dismissive of Occupy, and I actually didn't do any platypus in this sort of second term Obama because I didn't think there was really any uh, anything happening politically that was that interesting. But I think in retrospect, some of the critique of our um, you know electoral system and you know money and politics, et cetera, that were strong themes in the Occupy movement. Um, you know those those could be like um, that could be a solid direction for you know a future left um, might even be a better starting place than you know re you know reforming the labor movement which is like an intractable problem in, in the U S so I think that's one of the challenges I think for somebody who is interested in um, refounding left politics is to actually take seriously um, these different strands because they actually represent important roadblocks that the left has encountered um, and remains stuck with. So, you know, when I go to the Anarchist Book Fair in Oakland and see what those people are doing, I mean, a lot of them are way more deeply embedded in Bay Area uh, politics than the DSA is, which only canvases for um, you know ballot measures and this kind of thing. So they have a hugely different uh, characteristics to them. That you know, and part of the problem is really that they've been uh, it's been fractured and divided, and people have made a principle out of different kinds of defeats that the left has had over time, and those are you know the actual ideological roadblocks that we have to confront on the left. And it's tricky because certain aspects of the left seem goofier at different times. And, um, you know, that can be a you know, false positive. I mean, I also wanted to say that Occupy was the moment when I think the younger members of Platypus felt the salience of an older history, particularly the immediacy of the Seattle precedent and the way in which the Graberite, you know, the Grabers and the others were clearly just waiting out the anti-war movement um, and, you know, and, and reappearing in Occupy. Um, I also think that um, the issue that Occupy deepened or p potentially deepened, a, a, again, the question of Marxism as, or, or socialism more generally as a critique of democracy. Um, you know, the issue, I, mean, I, I said that in my comments, that, that Occupy was really, you know, it, it really you know, turned our attention to the issues of liberalism and democracy because that's obviously where the roots of anarchism are and I think that you know that sense of the oppressiveness of democracy uh, was much deeper uh, for a lot of our members and it's not surprising to me that um, you know the, the depth of the question of say Bonapartism uh, became much you know you know, became, I think, uh, clearer in pedagogy and emphasized in pedagogy if you look back across uh, the history of pedagogues calls and the way that we, uh, you know, read those texts and, and the kind of uh, overarching way in which the problem of the left has appeared uh, to Platypus. So that to me is another aspect of, of Occupy. <coughs> if I could just quickly add as a younger member, um, or, or someone who joined the project later and was not part of the founding moment, um, Occupy actually made me quite disinterested in anarchism, but the socialist turn uh, completely uh, renewed my interest in anarchism and its history and politics, um, ironically, because I finally, through, through the socialist turn, came to recognize that a political party for socialism would undertake uh, mass organization in civil society uh, in a way that would quite resemble 
uh, anarchism, both uh, historically and perhaps even in a certain way, uh, contemporary anarchism. Uh, and so that actually uh, made this entire range of history and politics um, extremely interesting to me in a way that it had never been before. And, and Occupy actually had the opposite uh, effect for a brief time. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I know there were some people who had their hand up. So if you had your hand up earlier and you still want to ask a question, do you? Okay, so we're going to take maybe uh, three that have been up for a while, and then we're going to have to stop. Um, sorry about that. And I'm going to trust that y'all will answer even the first question that is asked and not just the last. Because everybody thought it was always complaints about that. <laughs> biggest obstacles to Platypus growth and goals is its obscurity and complexity. How do you think Platypus has to deal with this? And another question would be maybe how does the, how has Platypus dealt with this throughout its history? Um, I have a simple question. I just wanted to ask uh, what in relation to each of the eras you're speaking about do you feel Platypus has forgotten about itself? Um, I asked this in relation to Tom in the past has told me Platypus had once said uh, Re Revolution 2017, which is something I would never have learned from any member, I think. Um, so I, I want to um, sort of dredge up what other things you feel Platypus has perhaps elided intentionally or forgotten about itself. Um, okay. um, this is uh, directed at Ed's remarks. Uh, there's a way, and also I guess um, well, Spencer's, there's a way in which it's almost as one might have the um, feeling that the history of the left gets revealed to us as we move through so that democracy, the party question, becomes clear as we move through these phases. Is that an illusion? Sorry, Anthony, could you repeat? I didn't. I was... <laughs> uh, okay, so we had three questions. So the first was what do we do about the fact that sometimes platypus can seem obscure and that seems like an obstacle? <coughs> the second was how does platypus um, forget about itself? And the third is like why do some of these things seem to become like more clear to us as we go on? Was that like. Are, are, we, are we seeing. Are, we, is, is it, are things getting clearer to us as we move through this? Like the nature of. Um, politics and society becoming clearer, or is that an illusion? I mean, what's becoming clear is the opacity of society, right? That, that's the kind of irony that, like, what's becoming clear is, like, I don't know if that's pithy to say, I don't know if that's <laughs> that, but... <laughs> um, I guess I was going to say, that. I mean, there's just inevitably like different registers that you have to deal with this. There's different registers that you have to deal with this kind of stuff. Um, I think our fora, when they're pulled off well, um, try to address basic topics like democracy, um, and that's the best way to introduce like a student to these issues, probably. Um, and I think you know. I was surprised at a event, a DSA event that they were holding at um, at Cal at, at Berkeley, where um, you know it was another one of their events where they wanted people to get involved in one of their canvassing campaigns. But all the undergraduates kept on raising their hand and asking things like, "Well, what, what's socialism in your opinion?" Um, you know that kind of thing. So I think that's what what is appealing to people, um, or certain people on a, on, a, on a basic level, and that's the the starting place. And I think. Over time, we have a, more of a sense of the different questions there. And the other question? Oh, I guess I was going to say I, I had forgotten the anti war stuff the most, and I've become kind of like uh, desensitized to the kind of typical like anti imperialist politics. And when people kind of bring that up, I'm just sort of like, oh, okay. um, you know, like, <laughs> don't really engage that, where I was like really animated by that. Um, at the time, and um, I don't know if I've processed whether it's good that I've brushed that off or not, but I'm glad it's not the central theme. The obscurity question. 
Yeah. I, I, I just want to say that. The, um, I, I think the third question and the first question are re related. Um, what's really obscure is a panel like this, <laughs> right, that is deeply navel-gazing at a fundamental level, right, in terms of our own history. Um, and the issue is one, you know, which is why I read that quote out at the beginning of my remarks, that Platypus is an attempt to organ, is an organized attempt to try to learn from the present. And the present reveals the past in different ways at different moments. And so the question of the phases of Platypus, the history of Platypus trying to convey that is precisely the attempt to learn from our own activity, um, right? Which is, you know, I don't want to necessarily speak to the success of that, uh, but it has to do with, you know, the, the organization is an attempt to learn from the present in an accumulating way, right? Which is the real point, and, and that's where the real obscurity lies uh, for a new member, right? Is the way in which, you know, to, to be a student of the present is also to be a student of our own activity uh, through time, but that's in a sense the only resource that we have. Uh, so, you know, that's just to, in a sense, underscore the assumptions behind putting on this panel, which is really what I hear those two questions relating to. So I'll leave the rest of my other panelists. Uh, oh, this is on. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, to reply to Jack's question uh, about things that have been allied in, you know, uh, what's kind of being forgotten. Um, yeah, it's funny that uh, you raised the point about uh, 2007, revolution in 2017, because I was actually thinking about that when I wrote uh, my opening remarks, uh, specifically in regard to uh, the point that I was trying to make about uh, how Platypus is, is attempting to not impart not, uh, actionable knowledge so much as an experience of the present uh, as conditioned uh, by this deeper history. Um, and, you know, it, it occurred to me that, like, as we're talking about, like, entering decade two and, and uh, you know, 2017 has come and gone, you know, I've thought about that uh, many times that, like, <coughs> you know, when I first joined Platypus, uh, there's kind of this notion that, like, you know, the goal was revolution by 19, or 2017, but looking back on it, there's really no, uh, Platypus has never had a clear sense of like means and ends for that sort of thing to happen. And I think that that's actually integral to, to what Platypus is doing, that Platypus can't uh, try to uh, answer that question of like, okay, how would we make revolution by 1917? And so, um, yeah, I, th I think that there are just some things that a lot of us can't, can't do. The and tourists are hearing revolution in 2017, and they're, <laughs> they're stopping. <laughs> yeah, you missed it, actually. Um, and nor should it, though. One point that I left out is that, uh, you know, not only do I think a lot of us remains necessary, but I think it remains necessary as an independent activity, uh, because for a to to, uh, you know, subordinate itself in any way to some sort of practical or more positive kind of formulation of what is to be done, uh, we would lose something essential about our the critical role we're trying to play. So, um, and I think that the price of that is that we can't do uh, the other thing, which is answer the means ends question. I mean, we have a means ends relationship between our activity and, uh, you know, provoking recognition of the problem, but that's a different issue. So. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, actually for me, the 
period of platypus that I've forgotten the most is actually the Occupy period, which I was uh, asked to talk about. Um, I remember my first year in platypus so well, like crystal clear. Occupy, it's all a blur to me. Uh, so I'm not sure why that is, but there's that. Um, oh, and then to Indoni's question, and um, yeah, I feel like like my experience in platypus has been like a series of kind of disorientations in a way, and then having to relearn things. And so uh, I don't know how that exactly answers your question, but that's been my experience at least. And I think that is is also you know can can be related to. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, uh, but. Uh, to your question in the back, uh, and you know, in that, I think that uh, confusion is actually something that is also integral to to a lot of us. So, um, you know, we don't necessarily want people to not be confused. I guess uh, in response to the second question about. Uh, what we've forgotten. I would say I really pitched my remarks to try to recover some of what we might otherwise forget, or some of what made us has made us uh, uncomfortable organizationally, um, and, and for good reason. Um, with respect to Revolution 2017, um, I guess one, uh, maybe one thought that comes to mind is that we did, in a sense, witness Revolution 2017 in the sense of uh, capitalist revolution, or arguably bourgeois uh, revolution in 2017 uh, under, you know, in, in capitalist form. And I think that relates to the question of the nature of politics and society, right? Because I think through a platypus education, we can understand how Trump signals both um, revolution and conservatism, right? How neoliberalism in its time likewise was revolutionary and conservative. How Keynesian Fordism in its time uh, was likewise revolutionary and conservative. How progressive Wilsonianism in its time was likewise uh, revolutionary and conservative. Um, these are sort of big framing uh, uh, ideas, um, but I think this gets at something that we are trying to work through in our project in a way that I don't see much of the rest of the left uh, working through. And uh, to address the first question, I guess I would say that in comparison to when I first came around the project to now, now we feel like, uh, to me, uh, like a group of teachers, people who are teaching themselves and each other. When I first came around the project, um, it often felt like a click. It often felt like uh, you know we were talking at that time about smartism, right? Um, because uh, uh, it uh, it seemed very difficult to access the project, including for reasons of social integration, um, but also the way that we were um, not necessarily teaching ourselves and each other effectively um, on the basis of what we were learning. So um, I I don't know if that's a great answer, but I think you know we should all be embracing something of a teacherly ethos. Um, and I think we have uh, more so as a project uh, over the past um, seven years or so. Okay, thank you everybody for coming out to this panel.